It's time for Supply Chain Now. Broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Heard around the world, Supply Chain Now spotlights the best in all things supply chain. The people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good morning. Scott Luton with Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Today's episode, we're talking with several business leaders that are helping companies manage their fuel supply chains, perhaps an overlooked element in the industry, right? We're certainly going to be working hard to raise your supply chain leadership IQ. Uh, more to come on that in just a moment. But hey, quick programming note before we get started. If you like today's episode, and I bet you will, really enjoy the, pre, the, the pre-show warm up. Hey, make sure you check us out and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. All right. So with no further ado, let's welcome in our guests here today. We're uh, going to be t- chatting with Allison Sheffield, the Aguero president and CEO of Diversified Energy Supply and her colleague, Fernando de Aguero, Chief Operating Officer, also with Diversified Energy Supply. Good morning, Allison and Fernando. Good morning. Good morning. So, you know, as we were chatting before we went live here, really, I, I, I've come to really start appreciating your background, the journey you're on, all the growth you've had in an industry that unfortunately might get overlooked a bit. You know, we've, uh, as I shared with you, we're fastly approaching when this episode publishes, we'll be right around 500. And shame on us that we have not focused on what powers global supply chain and, and, and the fuel supply chain. So I'm looking forward to, to, to raising my own IQ as we work through this conversation. We're happy to be a part of that. Thank you so much for having us on. You bet. All right. So um, let, before we talk shop, so to speak, and industry and get some of your thought leadership and experiences, let's get to know you, both of y'all a little bit better. So Allison, for starters, you know, tell us about where you grew up and give us an anecdote or two about your upbringing. Oh, of course. Um, well, I was the daughter of a fuel logistics officer in the Air Force. So I was actually born overseas in Germany, um, spent most of my childhood moving from you know place to place, uh, wherever my father was stationed um, as we were growing up. Um, we uh, ended up landing in South Alabama, where um, he then retired from the Air Force and went to work uh, with the family business, which was also an oil company, Sheffield Oil Company. Um, once he retired from that particular uh, company, he then moved on to work for a, a jobber uh, in South Alabama. Um, myself, um, I came up, went to school um, in Alabama ended up moving over to Mexico uh, for a few years, picked up the Spanish language, and then came back and started my career um, working in inside sales for different companies um, in their Latin American divisions, um, just using, using some skills that I had. Love that. So l- let me ask a couple follow-up questions. Going back to sure. being the, the, um, the daughter of a, of a career Air Force veteran and the moving around, yeah. how... how um, you know, we talk to a lot of folks like that and, and, you know, constantly meeting new people, immersing themselves in new communities. They, mm-hmm. they have to um, adapt more so than, than many others that might grow up and live in the same place for most of their formative years. That's got to be a great advantage uh, now being, you know, leading a business and, and meeting and, and, you know, uh, new people all the time that do deals. That big advantage. I, I have to agree that yes, it is a, it is a big advantage. Um, I had the benefit of meeting all different kinds of people from all different walks of life, um, being able to understand uh, just different cultures as you're mixed in, um, just as you're brought up in, in, in the early years, um, there's really not a, um, a chance to, to put down roots, so to say. So that was different for me. We've, we've been here in Atlanta since uh, the year 2000. So this is more of a new experience for me as I grew up um, just being in the mix with all different sorts of people. I do think it's an advantage for me because as I meet people, I'm able to just be flexible and understand different points of view. Um, Those things aren't foreign to me uh, because I've, I've, I've seen a lot. I've met a lot of different people. I've, I've had that advantage. Love that. 
Allison, I, th- I, th- mm-hmm. I wish more people had those experiences because yeah. I would think it would create a lot more dialogue and, and we could bust through some of the challenges that we face globally. Um, all right. I so agree. I don't want to put you on the spot. One final question. Sure. So growing up in Alabama now, you know, 20 years here in Atlanta, which is you mm-hmm. get your native badge, uh, as I understand it, yeah. after 15 <laughs> years. Um, yeah. foot, when it comes to football, where, oh. are, where are your allegiances? I'm watching closely. Oh my goodness. This is, this is such a loaded question. Okay. Um, well, multiple teams my father, is fine. my father was a diehard Georgia fan. So I always have to cheer for the dogs. I mean, that's just a loyalty thing for me. However, uh, my husband is a Georgia tech grad. So we, we do have a little conflict there, you know, at least once a season. Um, but we are also, um, we are also big fans of the Miami Hurricanes. So we're, we're pretty broad. Again, there's a lot of love diversity it. in our football language. So <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's a great place to be. All right. So Fernando, and I also heard when you said you're watching that as she answered that question. So love that we can relate. <laughs> I think, um, you know, why now, right? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> All right. So same question, Fernando, let's get to know you a little bit better. So tell us, you know, where'd you grow up? What were some of your experiences you know, in your formative years? And who knows, we might end up on football too. So I'm first generation in the U.S. Uh, my mother and father were born in Cuba and fled communism. Uh, they uh, came to the U.S. and each of them were placed in orphanages here. And they met later in life. And, uh, and I, my brother and I were the first generation. I was born up north, but I was there for a very short period of time. So I don't claim to be a Yankee by any means. Uh, spent most of my youth in Atlanta. Moved here in 77. Uh, but I also spent some time in Miami each year uh, with family down there. So I kind of claim both places as my upbringing area. Um, I, as I was growing up, I didn't really um, connect, right, in either place because I, I would spend part of the year in each. So I, I connected at a certain level through sports and things you do as youth. But I really, because I claim two different places as my home, they're so different. I got a little bit of that benefit of that diversity of views, cultures, languages uh, between Miami and Atlanta. And, uh, and so that helped form, uh, I think, this flexible nature. I could slide into one group or slide into another group very easily. And that really helped me, particularly when I, uh, when I got into the college years and I started co-oping uh, when I was in college with uh, Georgia Power here, Southern Company. Uh, and, I, and I really started being able to connect in the professional environment with people from all different walks of life because I could find something to connect with that particular person on. And so uh, that part of my childhood actually translated nicely into early years of adulthood um, until I got really straightened out when I met Allison in, in my late 20s. And then, then I really, you know, <laughs> then I really got straightened out. But um, that, that's a little bit about my childhood. Um, let me ask you a question. I, I love, I appreciate you sharing that about your, your parents, the trailblazers that they were. Um, mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I, I can only imagine as they landed here in the States and as you said, they both uh, were put in orphanages and um, what, as you look back now, what have they shared? What, what's one big lesson learned from your parents as they experienced that? Uh, and now, you know, the fruits of, of their, um, efforts you know you and your brother successful entrepreneurs and and in great businesses what an out, awesome story what, what's one lesson that they really taught you that you um you know maybe carry with you each day well there i'll tell you my father is um very articulate in particular um and there's two things that he you can't have a conversation without getting some flavor of one of these or both of these things and one is there is no replacement for, and there is no shadow of freedom, period. Mm. You're either free or you're not. And if you don't have freedom, then none of the rest matters. And I think that's rooted in being ripped out of, ripped out of your family, ripped out of everything you know at 10 years old and being sent to another country where you don't speak the language. You know, in 1960, 61, there was no internet. There wasn't really even uh, you know, there was no cable, there, there was really no visual or audio, audio information coming from other countries. So this was really like 
picking up and leaving and moving to another planet with no adults, just, you know, so from a, from an experience perspective, that's got to be really traumatic as a child. And, uh, and so that, that idea of if you don't have freedom, you have nothing is really number one. Mm. And number two, compromise, <laughs> compromise. Everyone has to compromise in, in all things in life. Now you don't compromise the things that are important. You take a stand on those things, but when it comes to um, negotiations and um, and a negotiation would be what movie do you want to go see tonight? <laughs> I'm not just talking business, right? Pick the things that matter and stand firm on those things. And for me and for Allison, it's everything that's rooted in our faith. Uh, that is not, it's uncompromisable. But on everything else, in the long picture, it's compromisable, yes. right? So work with people as you go. So those are, the, I think, the two big things is freedom and, and compromise. I love that, especially that first one. Um it makes things easier, right? When it, when it's crystal clear and, and that, that simplicity. Um, and then, right. and then the second point, you know, it, it goes back to that dialogue that we were talking about with Allison a second ago. You know, I, I, I believe that not enough dialogue is taking place. You've got hardened positions and it really mm -hmm. is part of the reason why I believe we are where we are. So at least here in the States, right. but, Nevertheless, hey, we're big optimists. We're gonna we're gonna break through, and and I love hearing these stories from business leaders such as yourself. So, to that end, let's let's keep going down your journeys before before diversified energy supply. Let's talk about your professional journey. Both of y'all kind of alluded to it already, but let's, let's talk about what you did a little bit more before your current roles, and in particular, was there a certain mentor or coach that you look back at um, and that was was critical to your development. I'm sorry, Allison, I'll start with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think that one's for me. Um, thank you. Uh, so uh, I alluded to, yes, I um, came back from Mexico, started working in inside sales um, in the Latin American division for a couple of companies. One of them was um, an engineering equipment company. The other one was um, software, security software. Um, from there, um, I took the leap as a mother, um, took a few years off to start our family. We, um, we have four kids, I'm happy to say, um, four amazing kids. Um, did take some time to start that process, start the family, get them um, situated, and then came alongside of uh, Fernando as we started our first company, which was a natural gas um, retail company here in Georgia. Um, worked with him on the marketing efforts, uh, came alongside particularly to the Hispanic communities, using that skill set that I had um, previously been using. Uh, from there, we started our um, electric retail company. Um, moving forward, we got into uh, DES Wholesale, Diversified Energy Supply, um, starting this company as a um, natural gas wholesale company um, to utilities out in California. Um, in 2014, I actually uh, took over the company from Fernando. He was uh, primary on the nat gas, and we decided to take a shift over into petroleum. Um, and we started growing the company with a focus on petroleum um, wholesale uh, nationwide to customers that have um, just a larger nationwide footprint. Um, and yeah, we've been going strong from there. Wow. Um yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we've got three kids here. And, and so mm -hmm. uh, any, any time I run into someone with more kids than me, it, it reminds me how small my problems might be. It's, a, it, it's amazing to, to raise a family and, and to, to accomplish the feats that you're accomplishing mm -hmm. and more. Um, it's a really, uh, what, now what are your four kids? You don't have to share too much if you don't like to, but what, uh, what are they up to? Are, are they, are they really interested in the business or they have other interests? What are, are they? Um, a chip oh, off goodness. the block or? Oh, goodness. Uh, that's, um, you know what? I, I don't mind talking about my kids at all. They're amazing. Um, so I have three boys and a girl, um, 16, 15, 10, and eight. Our daughter is our youngest one. Um, all of them are hybrid homeschoolers. So we've got an additional challenge um, this season um, as they're in school a couple of days a week and then out of school, you know, working from home. 
Um, so definitely want to give a shout out to my mother who's giving us a tremendous amount of support in that, in that area. Um, so we can go on and continue to do what we're doing here with the company. Um, but the kids are, are amazing. Um, my oldest is actually, uh, more interested in ministry than anything else. He's wanting to be an evangelist and a preacher. So, um, he's a 4.0 student and just loves the Lord. So that's, that's his primary focus. Um, next sundown, same, same type of thing. Not quite sure what he wants to do, but he's more mechanically inclined, I think. Um, and then our younger two, just coming up, being kids, um, riding horses and playing football and that sort of thing. And um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a busy, good life. Love that. Gosh, yeah. love that. And it's great that kids can be kids in, in, in a challenging year like 2020, historically challenging year. Mm-hmm. That's great to hear. All right. One final question for you, Allison, is, you know, mm-hmm. given the journey you described, both mm-hmm. past and present and all points in between, what's one eureka moment? that really sticks out um, to you here today? Um, goodness, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, I think my, my biggest eureka moment, if I'm just gonna be totally transparent, uh, was the moment that I realized it was okay for me not, not to have all the answers, mm. but it wasn't okay for me to, to stay that way. Um, I don't have to know everything, but it's not okay to stay in a state of ignorance. It, it's, you have to broaden your scope. You have to continue to move forward and open your mind and, and seek the information and the knowledge and the skill sets um, that, are, that are ultimately going to help you be more successful, help you to be um, broader in, in your offerings as a person, as a wife, as a mother, as an employer, um, in all areas. So I think, you know, taking the pressure off myself to be perfect or to to have all of the answers and just surround myself with the people that can help me get there. Mm. Um, and just to continue to grow myself in all those areas so I can, I can learn and, and ultimately be broader in what I have to offer. Love that. You know, there, there's that, um, when you, when you, want to say the word I don't know or the phrase I don't know there there's Mm -hmm. a um transparency there is a what's the word I'm thinking of a um a certain place that leaders don't always embrace Mm -hmm. right because it it shows a little bit of of um um what is the word it's not insecurity it is um like a vulnerability vulnerability thank you Allison yeah and that is such a powerful thing to embrace and and I think it it Mm -hmm. it really keeps conversations honest and transparent and truthful and and -hmm. powerful with the team so I I really appreciate you sharing that uh with us Allison I'm a big believer a lot of kindred spirits there Mm -hmm. um all right so Fernando let's uh let's talk about your uh journey as well you know feel free if, if you, um, you know, coaches, coaches, mentors, uh, guides, you know, that's been really instrumental in my life. But if, if there's one in your life that really comes to mind, I would love to learn more about that. And, you know, we've got to get a eureka moment from you as well. <laughs> sure. Sure. And I'll weave in kind of professional history journey you know, as well. Please. It. Yeah. It's all, it's all, it's all interrelated. It's of all course. connected, right? It's all interconnected. It is. It is. <clears throat> I was not the most motivated high schooler uh, when it came to academics. Um, the Lord did bless me with the ability to learn and retain and mm-hmm. synthesize uh, for more than just academia, but I didn't really take advantage of it. There was one, the first mentor, and I wouldn't really label him a mentor. I would call him a person across my life that pivoted me to see something more. It was a, um, a high school teacher. And coincidentally, his name was Mr. Sheffield. Okay. <laughs> but this was a, uh, an older teacher. No relation. Uh, I had no relation. <laughs> that would have been a perfect uh, had, story, Fernando. Perfect story. <laughs> it, it would have been, yes. Um, but he, he uh, was a kind of a, a, a weird bird, but I connected with him. And he helped me see things in myself that no one, no one ever pointed out and no one ever showed me to look towards, right? So I'd have to identify him early on uh, when I didn't really have a lot of direction as someone who helped point me in the right direction. Um, moving forward, um, I, I, I don't want to use up our time talking about my detailed 
history, but I do want to say I did uh, end up at Georgia Tech <clears throat> for my undergraduate degree. And I earned a, a bachelor's in nuclear engineering while I was there. Well, all um, right, I got to pause it for a second. A nuclear engineering degree from Georgia Tech. I've, I've just realized just how far out of my league I am in this conversation, Fernando. I, goodness gracious, how'd you get in? That's amazing. I mean, that, that's there was a, no sleep. There was no sleep during those <laughs> years, literally. And there's another story around that, but there was literally no sleep, particularly the last year. Uh, we had a, a, quote, large class, and there were 16 of us in my class, okay? And I just had the unfortunate and in some ways fortunate um, uh, timing of being there with two National Science Foundation scholars at a school that curves, that grades on a curve. So I didn't, ne I never felt like the smartest guy in the room. My roommate, uh, I think half of those folks ended up, including my roommate, earning PhDs, becoming professors at schools, working at the national labs on the top secret projects where they locked you underground, uh, those kinds of things. Uh, so uh, I enjoyed my time there. I learned a tremendous amount on how to learn things you don't know. And that's really the big, the big takeaway. Uh, the math helped as well. Um, <laughs> But it was really, how do I solve things? I have no idea how to solve, right? Mm -hmm. Learn a process of a process. Yeah, that so, varies so uh, well, I mean, Fernando, with what Allison was just sharing. I, you know, it seems like that might be a common theme in our conversation today. You know, we all have those knowledge gaps. It's just some are more willing to, to uh, acknowledge them and then tenaciously right. go after filling them. So I appreciate okay. you sharing that, Fernando. Yeah, and, and there's an extended concept there, which we may touch on later on. So I just want to say it now. There is no problem that's unsolvable with the exception of very, very few. Mm. The question is, what are you willing to do to solve it, right? And sometimes that means getting the right brains in the room. Sometimes that means uh, making the right commitments. So there is no problem that's unsolvable with the exception of very few. Love that. Um, so moving along, uh, I, I got into the work. And by the way, when I was at Georgia Tech, I co opted uh, so I, I earned a five-year degree, but I also co-opt, which was a two-year program where you're not in the classroom. You're actually at the workplace as an employee. It's not an internship. Uh, and so it was a seven-year process to get my undergraduate degree with the co-op designation. Most people would say, hey, that doesn't make a lot of sense. You could have gotten a master's in, in another two years. But I, uh, because of the co-opting, I actually pivoted during college from what I thought I wanted to do when I graduated into what I actually wanted to do. I would have never learned that being in a classroom and reading books. I had to be in the field and mm. see the folks doing that work to realize I better not do this. I'll be miserable for the next 30 years. And right? that's more important that that lesson learned and the opportunity to learn that lesson is probably more important than any advanced degrees yeah, out there. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe someone that's listening to this podcast has uh, students that are, at that age, uh, and I'll, I'm certainly going to do this with our kids, encourage cooperative programs, get in the workplace and actually see what the quote real world really looks like in your major uh, before you commit long-term to point. a direction. So uh, moving along, uh, I, I ended up with an offer before I graduated uh, to go work for Georgia Power in their nuclear group. Um, so I was a Southern company guy as a co-op during college, and I became a Southern company guy uh, when I entered the workforce. Um, I also uh, began night school, uh, weekends and nights to earn a uh, master's in business administration uh, while I was early in the workforce years. Um, so I have an undergrad in engineering and then a, uh, an MBA. After a few years, I took a, tra a transfer position to a subsidiary Southern Company in Atlanta called Southern Company Energy Marketing, which IPO'd three months after I arrived and spun off. So all of a sudden, I thought I was a lifer at Southern Company. I was doing my rotation. I'm no longer in the company. Uh, but it was a blessing. I got to learn a heck of a lot from a lot of smart folks. Um, there was uh, about, about a dozen people in the group I worked in. Uh, myself and one other were the only two, quote, dumb guys that didn't have a PhD in the group. So I got to learn a lot from a lot of smart folks during those years and just happened to be there during the energy boom uh, in 2000, 2001 and the Enron, Enron initiated uh, collapse. Uh, so I was one of the three architects of the plan of reorganization when the company I worked for filed for bankruptcy. 
Uh, and I learned even more during that time than all of the other years when we were operating in the boom. Hmm. I think, um, uh, you know, I, the, the Lord just put me in the right place at the right time to learn a lot during those years. So moving along, um, I really got to understand business at a much deeper level by putting my hands on it, not just reading the books and taking the tests. Hmm. And when I, I, I transitioned, we were having our first son at the time, I transitioned to Atlanta Gaslight Company for more stability. And when I got there, um, I came in, did some things for them, but ultimately the board, uh, I'm sorry, not the board, the CFO and the CEO asked me to analyze how to deploy a significant amount of capital. And I had to report back on in about six months to the board. And so they wanted some, some intelligence and some modeling around that. And in that process, I realized, hey, asset light businesses that cash flow quickly are really the way to go. And so in that process, I talked myself into getting out of corporate America and becoming an entrepreneur because it's a heck of a lot easier to get into an asset light business than it is to build an asset heavy business in the energy industry. Right. Right. So that led me to, um, to launch our first company. Allison alluded to it. It was a natural gas mm -hmm. retailer in Georgia. And then moving along, we started a natural gas, elect I'm sorry, a retail electric company in Texas. Uh, then we built, uh, we started a company that built the first smart meter. If, you're, if you've heard of that or had people on the program uh, around smart infrastructure, the utility mm -hmm. space, smart meters and so mm -hmm. forth. We built the first piece of software that actually allowed utility companies, gas, water, and power to, uh, to utilize that infrastructure and create better product services, billing, intelligence for consumers of those commodities, uh, wow. which is everyone, right? Um, from there, we went ahead and transitioned and we started this company in 2011. And so that's kind of the professional background. Uh, the, the company, our company today, we'll talk about a little more, I'm sure in a few questions, is really centric around technology. Um, you could call us fuel tech, similar to FinTech. We're kind of yes, fuel tech. I love it, or, or logistics um, tech, freight tech. Love it, that's fuel right. tech. That's right, mm -hmm. well, that's right. So, and by the way, the, the mentors, uh, the, the most influential person during those years in my life was not someone in business. It was someone who taught me what it is to be a man, what it is to be a husband, a father, a son, and just, just a human being, uh, which translates into every area of life. And he was a retired pastor, um, he's still alive. He became a very close friend and I chose to take half a day a week. So I'm taking hours away from work, half a day a week, 52 weeks a year to just sit with him and disciple with him and learn from him. And, uh, and that was transformational and it did translate into the business world very quickly mm. because it gave me my eureka moment. <laughs> and the that... eureka moment was, it's not about the business. The business is a byproduct. If you do things, properly the business will work and that that properly is a big word that we could spend a half hour unpacking but that's the eureka moment is that mm -hmm. it's not about the business uh the business is is going to happen one way or the other based on actions that are taking your life the seeds that you plant the people that you connect and the people you choose not to connect with right all those are so, choices that's and right. that's that's one of the the better things i've learned about being an entrepreneur is you get you get the to seek out and elect to partner and collaborate with, with the greatest people in the world. Right. And, right. and to your point, you get to choose not to partner with some of those folks that may be a bit more, a uh, bit different, uh, challenging right. or, or you, you fill in the blank, but regardless, I love that. I, I love that story. There's so much there. We're going to have to bring y'all back for a, a multi-part episode because both of y'all's journeys are so much more there. I'm sure you could write a couple of books, both of you, but let's, let's, Transition over to diversified energy supply mm -hmm. and, and really quick, you know, what the company does. And then, and Allison, we'll start with you. If you could sure. in a nutshell, tell us about what the company does and then tell us about some of the unique complexities, dynamics that a lot of folks probably don't appreciate about the industry you're in. Okay, sure. Um, so the bottom line for our company is we're going to provide you the fuel that you want, that you need. Uh, when you want it, where you want it, in the way that you want it. Um, we focus on customers that have um, 
large, large footprints, nationwide footprints. They have complex fuel needs. We've got folks that need anything from just straight bulk delivery down to mobile refueling where we actually come and we uh, fill each individual tank in a fleet of vehicles. Um, we do consigned fuel, we do fuel carts, just anything that you can imagine, um, we come to you and, and, and provide that service for you. So um, one of the things that makes us different is we started this company with the idea that we wanted to, um, we really just wanted to solve problems. Um, we noticed that there, there are customers that are frustrated, there are folks that are out there that have all of these complexities around their business and they're really looking for um they're looking for an easy button they they do what they do they manufacture or you know they distribute food or supplies or construction um they're not in the fuel business they just need this to make sense they need it to be simple and when it comes time to pay the bill they need it to be clear so what we try to do is go in we ask for your worst possible mess, whatever mess you've got, the, the worst location you have, um, where nobody else can get it right, give us that, give us an opportunity. This is how we um, establish our, our relationship with our, with our largest customer that we have. Um, give, us, give us the worst thing you got, because you don't exactly just show up first day on the job and say, hey, I'm a fuel company, give me your, give me your business. You, know, <laughs> right. you, you really need to prove yourself. So there is a, there's a uh, approving time, especially with these these larger, more established companies. We're looking at Fortune 500 companies. They're not going to sign anything over just willy nilly. They they want to vet you, and I can certainly appreciate that. So we come in, we find out what the pain points are, and we work diligently to solve those problems. Um, one of the things that we came to realize very early on is that in the fuel space, in particular there was not a lot of technology that really um, supported the efforts um, of, of the companies that are providing fuel. So we just figured, you know, we'll just build it. So instead of um, just taking things and bolting pieces on to try and create a solution that we could then provide to the customers, uh, we've worked from the very beginning um, to create our own proprietary software our own proprietary software, uh, our own platform, and, and, and we can customize that. And um, that's one of our, our major differentiators is that we can pivot on a dime. We have our own uh, team of developers here in house and we can, we can take that uh, customer's problem and generate a solution in real time. And that's something that I know that a lot of them have, have come to really appreciate. We've got uh, just an excellent team of developers, just first class all the way. Um, so that's, that's something we're very proud of. And, you know, and we do offer the piece where we are a woman-owned business. So that's also very important to a lot of our customers. They're seeking to um, meet some supplier diversity goals. And, you know, we can do that as well. <laughs> so. Wow. Um, yeah. So, so many elements there. I love that the technology piece in particular, because mm -hmm. that's that, um, you know, having interacted, not interviewed, but interacted with some, some of the folks in the fuel business throughout my time in Atlanta, that's certainly something that I underappreciated. And I love y'all have developers. I mean, you can, you Absolutely. can build out programs. It sounds and, and really be a customized solution provider. Fernando, mm -hmm. uh, piggyback on that. What, what else would you add, especially as it, as it relates to, uh, complexities in the industry uh, from a supply chain standpoint. Yeah, so uh, and I think in order to transition to that more, uh, I guess bro the broader question of the supply chain is understanding there's a severe lack of controls in the historical fuel supply chain, severe lack of controls. And the reason is it's a fragmented supply chain where there's, you know, if you're let, let's take a very common sense example. If you're selling electricity to someone, somebody owns a power plant and it's got a big cable connected to it. They make the product there. It comes down the cable and it goes through a couple transformers and it's measured along the way and eventually it hits your business or your home. There's no human touching anything. When it's produced, it shows up over here instantaneously, right? It's fungible, right? Well, in fuel, you've got physical gallons that are produced at a refinery okay they've got to be inserted into a pipeline it's got to physically move down that pipeline 
and then it comes off the pipeline in whatever market you're in, let's say the Atlanta market, it comes off and then it's stored at a local terminal here in the Atlanta market where there are humans involved, valving product here and there and blending and right. all kinds of activities, which we don't need to get into. That's a complexity that won't help buyers, <laughs> you know, but mm -hmm. um, at that point, you've got a truck that's driven by a human that shows up and puts fuel in multiple compartments in a truck. And then the, that's the start of the distribution portion of the supply chain. I love that, that you're painting, to... uh, Fernando. If I can interrupt just for a second, I love how you're painting the fuel, the end-to-end -end fuel supply chain, because yeah. that I'm sure folks mm -hmm. don't. Uh, that's highly underappreciated. So I love that. We we need an infographic that captures that next time we have you on. <laughs> we can certainly help you with that if you'd like to do that. And <laughs> and that is true. It's it's kind of like electricity. You just flip the switch and you expect it to work. Right. And you don't care what's upstream. Uh, and if it doesn't work, you scream. Well, same thing with fuel. You just expect fuel to be in your tank. And when your fleet vehicle needs to get out on the road to deliver, you know, Coca-Cola products, it, it just needs to work, right? So this guy shows up, a human drives a truck, loads at the terminal into multiple compartments in that truck, has to drive it to a location, and then has to connect hoses, physically offload each compartment of that truck into whatever location the customer wants it. Uh, there's a lot of human touch in this process. How do you document how much is moving from point A to point B as tidal right. transfers? You know, is there a loss of temperature, you know, change in the fuel causes expansion? There's all kinds of complexities in this thing mm -hmm. uh, that creates slip seams where lack of controls occur, right? Did the driver leave all the fuel that was on the paperwork? How do you know? Mm. And maybe he left one compartment for himself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by the way, it's fuel. It, it's, you know, you have all yeah. the safety and the, um, the control yeah. points that, that need to be factored in, you know, being that it, it's right. a flammable uh, uh, product that you're, you're shipping and managing it. Holy cow. No wonder. That, well, that there, both... there's, it's, mm -hmm. it's technically EPA hazmat, right? So insurance is different. You know, we take, lots of trucks onto airport properties around the country. Mm. It's not easy taking an 8,000 gallon firebomb across a <laughs> runway. <laughs> right? So there, there's, there's all kinds of stuff that the customers don't really think about that, and they shouldn't think about it. That's what we do. Yeah. But understanding that, that complexity is, uh, is key. I, I love that, you know, through all the shows, we've had wonderful people from that, that ship and manage coffee supply chains that ship mm -hmm. and manage uh, all kinds of products, right? And and all of them have their sure. unique challenges, right? And and unique problems and and issues they deal with. But what you've just described, um, and just the the regulation and the policy and the the um, oh, yeah. you know all the state and and federal and all the different authorities and the levels you've got to go through, I can only imagine how that uh, adds to the complexity of just the sheer management of the fuel supply chain. So. Mm -hmm. um, We'll have to dive in deeper, but now I understand sure, why yeah. y'all you've got to have the backgrounds that both y'all have to, to to navigate through that and to grow the company and given what it does. So let's yeah, and let's that talk. that is the the supply chain up to the customer location. We manage yeah. that, but there's a heck of a lot more that buyers need to really understand once that fuel gets to their property mm. around right. financial controls. How do they monitor yeah. for employee fraud? You know, there's all kinds of other things that we do for them or we assist them so that they have the right tools mm. to, to manage that. Uh, and we can talk about that at some point here in the next few questions. If Sounds very holistic in terms of, of, yes. of the value prop. Mm. So let's talk about your roles. As we talked about in the pre-show, everyone makes a lot of assumptions, CEO and COO and where you spend your time and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. Uh, Allison, tell us about, you know, what you do day in and day out as president CEO. Um, generally speaking, I oversee, uh, the treasury aspect of the company, the strategy, the direction we're going in. Um, I push a lot of paper. <laughs> that's, that's the short answer. Um, I, I oversee uh, the people, what's, what's happening inside this building, what's happening on our team, um, making sure that everybody has the tools that they need here to be successful and to do their job. Um, 
I, you know, looking for different ways to, to grow and, and asking the questions of the team to see um, where the gaps are, where, where can we step in, where, can be, where we can be more effective, where can we um, grow in ways that we hadn't thought of, where can we, um, where can we position ourselves, not just to um, sell a bunch of fuel, but to, but to market ourselves as a complete solution. Um, to folks that are that are needing something more than just uh, a low cost, um, a low cost load of fuel, you know, right. that, that's really my thing. And, and just really, um, my primary focus, my heart is is for the people here, um, for the company and just making sure that they can be successful um, and do the things that, that they were built to do well here and then they feel supported that they that they have what they need um to do that well mm, love that i love that um mm -hmm. all right same question for you fernando as C coo at diversified mm -hmm. energy supply where do you spend your time what's your favorite and what's maybe one of your favorite activities oh gee my, my number one favorite activity <laughs> is the creative part of the job and that is mm -hmm. Uh, s solving problems internally that then our team uses to go solve problems externally. What does that mean? It seems very fluffy. <laughs> it's, it, what it means is designing software solutions to real world problems. Uh, I work directly with our architect and our developers and our commercial teams to, I'm kind of the cross section between them all. And sometimes I have the, uh, the opportunity to step in and, and mathematically, you know, come up with solutions for things that haven't been done in the business. Sometimes it's just understanding from our salesman, for example, unique customer needs uh, and figuring out a way to, um, to solve them commercially and then translating that to, you know, our architect who then further translated and translates it into data models and, and code and, and whatnot. So it's a ever changing, uh, creative process because the world's always changing technology in the world is evolving the way customers of our customers want their products is changing uh, the level of uh, visibility in our customers internal platforms whether it's their accounting systems operating systems data warehouses are constantly evolving so you know it's a, it's a constant moving target and we want to be running the race in first place as we keep chasing the customer needs so that, that's the number one thing I enjoy doing is just being creative around solving the problems. I love it. And, uh, and every problem, as you said earlier, every problem except just a small few can be solved if you're really committed right. to solving it, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Absolutely. And the, the rest of my time is spent doing the, the, the customary things that, that you do when you run a business, you know, uh, uh, accounting operations you know mm -hmm. new su supply contract negotiations etc uh negotiating with you know microsoft on whatever it's 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 the things we all do in business but right. um the, the best part is to be just being creative love it love it that drive i'm sure that drives a ton of value all right so let's uh let's shift gears a little bit here let's talk about growth you know as we have uncovered y'all have grown tremendously especially in the last seven eight years um you know, kind of Reader's Digest, if y'all if y'all are familiar with that magazine. Let, let's take a lead, Reader's Digest yeah. version to this answer. What's a couple of things that, that you'd like to share, especially that other business leaders can either relate to or, you know, bake into their growth recipe for success? What, Allison, what, what would you point to? Oh, my goodness. Um, I think the, the secret to our success really has to be the technology and our ability – to, like I said, pivot on a dime. We aren't just settling for what has been customary in the fuel space, what has been uh, the offerings that are available to pretty much anybody. We're looking for the complexity, um, the, the complex challenges that are facing those customers. And we're trying to find the unique cutting edge ways to solve those problems, to bring that to the table in a way that's complete and comprehensive. So not just from the fuel delivery where they have the product, but down to the accounting side of things where things are transparent, they can report on that. They don't have any um, heartburn six months you know, down the road because something wasn't clear. Um, we're looking for ways to make it very dynamic and relevant for the customer. 
Um, and the only way to do that really is to stay as current as possible, technologically speaking, which is why we have the developers in house, um, which is why we have folks like Fernando who are extremely creative and um, they bring this broad skill set into the mix. And it, it's more than just uh, being smart, it's, it's applying that and bringing it into, um, into something tangible that we can then present to the market. Wow. Uh, we will, there's so much goodness there, Allison. <laughs> I appreciate and I appreciate as succinct you package all that in. You're a pro, I'll tell you. Fernando, um, she mentioned about not just how creative you are, but it, it's got to be a dangerous thing to, to pair your creativity with your highly technical background. And then of course, the technology and developing talent you've got there. Um, quite a skunk works. You've got uh, our, our architect, I have to really point to him and give him uh, kudos. His name is uh, William. He cut his teeth building missile guidance systems for the Air Force. Really? Um, yeah, he's 30 years ago. He's when he writes stuff, when he designs stuff, it just works. <laughs> and now you know why. If you right. start there, <laughs> you know, you're not going to work it very, very long. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but we are blessed with a tremendous group of uh, professionals in all areas of the business. Um, I think that really is, and I can tell you when I speak with them one-on-one, -on -one, it's almost exclusively an issue of, we just wanted to be part of this culture. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, they like being respected and, and supported rather than being told, bring me a rock, right? And I think, uh, we, you know, maybe we touch on that a little bit uh, later in the discussion. As far as the growth goes, um, growth is the most difficult thing to manage in a, in a business. And, you know, we were blessed to win uh, last year the um, ACG Fast 40 award. Uh, we actually were number two in the upper middle market. Nice. Uh, so that, that was a nice recognition. We weren't looking for any awards. They came to us and said, hey, wait a minute. We were nominated by folks that knew our business and are uh, plugged in with that organization. And uh, complete surprise to us. We've just been heads down, building, working, solving problems. And we were recognized for the results of that. And ACG uh, is the Association for Corporate Growth, I believe, right? That's correct. That's Quite an correct. honor. So it, it really is. Um, and that's all industries, you know, healthcare, IT, you know, so we were number two. Um, we uh, really, our growth has come, as Allison said, by solving problems and using technology. But it, it's not just that piece, because you can have a business that started, um, you know, on day one with that focus and it could collapse spectacularly. The other component of that is a very disciplined approach in the building of the business. So I'd encourage if you have entrepreneurs listening that are maybe looking to, um, you know, build solutions in the supply chain to meet customer needs. Um, you know, we did it with no debt. We never took a loan. We grew within the capital that we earned as we went. We invested everything that we earned for the first five years back into the business and took very little out, mm. um, very little. And, and that is a long view of the business. Uh, whenever I meet with people who are starting businesses, um, I, I seem to hear the same kinds of things, uh, which are, are not consistent with a long view and with how much work it takes to actually get there. But if you can make that commitment, uh, it, it does bear fruit mm. and our growth part of part of it was fueled by the way we built the company and part of it was fueled by what we did with that company in the marketplace and the third part is we really invested in people and brought in the sharp knives that equal four or five dull knives mm. right so uh <laughs> i think that you know the, that's the uh kind of secret sauce uh it's really a combination of those three mm. easily stated kind of hard to rep to, to build and replicate in another business. Um, right. I, yeah. So I hopefully that helps kind of color it. Right. And <laughs> yes. if you're a corporate buyer, um, you know, our, our growth is from, from a buyer's perspective in supply chain, we're just, you know, we're one of, one of the suppliers that happens to come in and look to partner with a buyer versus just telling them how great we are and come buy our stuff. Mm. We really strive to know, to meet and know and build relationships with, responsible managers and buyers in, in organizations so that we can better understand their pain points and, and solve that. This is not a new formula. Right. Uh, this is a very, you know, explicit set sales style. And, that, and that's, 
in our approach. Avoid the transactionality. I'm gonna make up a word here. Transactionality that that goes on so much across the industry, but really drive relationships and, and really right. getting to know um, beyond just the transaction. What what are their other needs? What are the other problems? I, I love that. A lot more value. All right. So for the sake of time, let's, let's shift gears. Let's, let's go broader. Right. Um, I, I tell you one, I think one of the, one of the things we talk about here, the, the silver linings in this historically challenging year is all the innovation that's taking place. The lessons, the business lessons learned in a variety of sectors across global supply chain, that's going to make all the industry stronger. And it's also going to allow us to handle the next curveball. Um, I hate to use this word resilience, but I mean that in a really meaningful way. Uh, so we'll be able to handle that next curveball in a more resilient manner. And right, and we'll, we'll, we'll have less, hopefully, knock on wood, we'll have less blind spots that have been, um, that have surfaced here in the last, you know, eight to 12 months, especially here in the States. What, what are y'all, <clears throat> as you survey global supply chain beyond the fuel supply chain industry, uh, Allison, what's one thing that you're tracking more than others here right now? Oh my goodness. Um, I would say uh, for me, it's, it's just that it's that ability to move quickly and pivot on a dime. When you see that the needs, uh, the needs of every company have, have seemed to change by and large, uh, where people are, are not traveling as much. They're not putting as much of a focus on, um, on being out in the market. Everything is, is just shifting back um, in. Um, the supplier has to pivot as well. So our focus has to go to um, where can we best support the, the industries that are in need? How do we make sure that uh, the, the food distribution companies are, are going to be able to deliver food? You know, we're just uh, one of the things that I know about our company in, in making those changes, um, we initiated this company to be able to be very um, flexible from the onset. So we can do our job whether we are out on the road or if we are here in the office in our home space. So for us, the transition was not difficult. Um, when things went on lockdown and everything changed just all of a sudden, we were able to tell our people, hey, just keep doing what you're doing. You've got the equipment, you've got the tools, you do your thing and let's look and see where the customers are hurting and we'll meet them where they're at. Um, I don't, Fernando's got uh, some, some really great stuff to share on this. I'm gonna actually yeah. turn this over to him. Sure, absolutely. So for, uh, Fernando, yeah. you know, piggybacking what Allison just shared, what else would you add in terms of what you're tracking globally? Yeah, so, um, before I jump into that, I just did want to say, <clears throat> I think Allison hit on something that was important, um, and it, it has a more global, uh, I think, result. We were always built to be nimble. Mm -hmm. uh, we were, we were, you know, a Microsoft beta customer in the Azure environment. So, you know, we're on the front end, literally the cutting edge on technology. So when something like a COVID pandemic hit, where we had these this inability to travel to see customers, inability to even travel to an office, or meet with suppliers, we didn't miss a beat because we were already fully virtualized. Uh, we were already under a hardened infrastructure. In fact, we just had a staff meeting one day and said, all right, guys, everybody work from home. Nothing had to be purchased. Nothing had to change. We just kept okay. doing our jobs. Uh, and the other component is because of the technology that we own, uh, mm -hmm. we can literally have our operations team on a, on a remote device, mm. like a tablet or a phone, uh, supporting customers, right? Dealing with order processing mm -hmm. and so forth. So it's, uh, and, and so that's our experience. And I think what we're seeing already and what we will continue to see for the next, you know, probably two years is lots of organizations making that transition rapidly. Mm -hmm. And even the largest organizations I'm already hearing from, you know, real estate professionals, they're not going to be renewing the big towers. They're going right. to cut their office spaces and start being more nimble. So the model we've flourished under is actually a model. I think everyone in the supply chain, whether you're a buyer or a seller, you know, supplier uh, is, is shifting towards. Now, as far as trends in the supply chain, I've been looking for one golden goose for years and it, I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, it's just a lot of uh, conferences and PowerPoints, but 
blockchain implementation in the fuel industry in particular would be a game changer. And, you know, if you think back to the commentary I made when, when laying out the uh, picture of what the supply chain looks at, we could eliminate a lot of uh, inefficiencies in the supply chain. Right. And uh, bake more trust having, and bake more trust into the whole end to end supply chain. Fuel that's supply. right. It's controls, right? Better controls, uh, rapid, rapid. It's going to accelerate the exchange of information. Uh, it, it's just a game changer. Uh, and so that's one of the big things that I've been looking for is uh, it's not that we don't know how we could actually build blockchain into customer products today. The problem is there's no unified standard in our space and there's no, uh, so by definition, because it's not unified, you don't have acceptance of it across the supply chain, whether you're a buyer or a supplier. Right. So uh, th that I think is one of the big transformational events that will occur eventually. When? I can't predict that today. Um, the, the other is, I think, a refocus as a result of the pandemic on supplier resiliency. And historically, you just look at that as a buyer from a financial perspective. But you can be a very large company and be ill-equipped for dealing with these disruptions and fail in your mission to serve that customer. So I think a renewed focus on infrastructure, mm -hmm. uh, on supply, the supplier's own supply chain depth is key, particularly yeah. in a commodity business like the one we're in, right. where we don't actually manufacture the fuels. The refiners manufacture them, right? Right. How many supply sources do you have in each market that you're going to serve me in is a question I would ask if I'm a buyer. How many delivery assets do you have access to how many trucks in our particular instance can you bring us product on? Because we saw the trucking companies started becoming thinner and thinner during the process because of COVID. They would have to quarantine. They didn't have enough drivers. They had right. the trucks, but not enough drivers, right? So right. these are details, but generally speaking, I think resiliency in the supply chain from suppliers mm -hmm. and their supply chains mm -hmm. and infrastructure should be a, a renewed focus and maybe a deeper focus than buyers have typically uh, you know, put in that area. Uh, I think those are the big ones. As far as traditional supply demand, uh, it's going to do what it's going to do. OPEC is going to do what they do in our particular vertical. Um, there'll be consolidation across many industries that we're already seeing. Uh, I think those are kind of normal shifts in the landscape. I don't think they're game changers. They're just the ebbs and flows of the cycles. Uh, the real game changers are technology-based blockchain and resiliency in the supply chain. Beautiful. Um, all right. Well, really have enjoyed um, getting my fuel supply chain certification over the last hour and some change. And I really I appreciate y'all sharing on the front end, you know, kind of uh, allowing our, our listeners to connect with your, your journey and your point of view. And, and, and the lens that you view, uh, not just business, but, but life through. That, I always find that really fascinating. So let's make sure our listeners know how to connect with each of you and, and learn more. So Alice, let's start with you. How can folks connect with you? Um, they can certainly connect with me on LinkedIn, Alison Diaguero, and uh, we have our website, diversifiedenergysupply.com. It's just that easy. I love that. And it Fernando? Is. I would echo the same thing, Fernando Diaguero. Uh, you can look up Diversified Energy Supply on LinkedIn and find mm -hmm. both of us there. Please connect with yeah. us and we would love to speak with you and understand you know, if you have needs, how we can help. And if you just have questions on what we do and some of the comments we've made, we'd like to expand on those with you. And uh, our contact us page, uh, we, we get back to any contacts you know, within 24 hours. Uh, so please feel free if that's easier to just pass your information along and we'll connect with you that way. Love that. And speaking of easier, we're going to make it the one click rule. We're going to have uh, LinkedIn profiles and the company site and the show notes to really make it easy for our listeners to connect and learn more. So really have enjoyed this conversation. Thank you both. We've been chatting with Allison Sheffield de Aguero, president and CEO at Diversified Energy Supply and her, her partner and, and husband, Fernando de Aguero, chief operating officer also with Diversified Energy Supply. Thank you both. Wonderful conversation, and we look forward to reconnecting real soon. Thank you, Absolutely. Scott. Thank you for the time. You bet. Thank you.
to our listeners, hopefully you've enjoyed this unique conversation as much as I have. I love both parts, both the, the, the journey and then diving deeper into, at least in my, uh, in, in my purview, a blind spot I had in my global supply chain experience. So uh, if you enjoyed this conversation, you can learn more and, and find more episodes at supplychainnow.com. Of course, you can find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. Uh, on behalf of our entire team, Scott Luton signing off here today. Hey, challenge you like we challenge ourselves. Do good, give forward, and be the change that's needed. And we'll see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.